السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم my dear brothers and sisters I hope you are all doing well إن شاء الله الحمد لله we are of course in the month of ذو القاعدة and we are approaching the month of ذو الحجة which of course began the most blessed days of the year in terms of action and one of the actions which many are planning currently is the action of udhiya or qurbani or sacrificing the animal. So today what I wanted to do is answer some FAQs or some frequently asked questions when it comes to the aspect of udhiya or qurbani. So inshallah, without further ado, we will begin. So the first question is, what are the virtues of Udhiyya? What are the virtues of Qurbani itself? So the Prophet ﷺ has actually mentioned various ahadith. For example, in Tirmidhi, uh, in, a, in a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ has said that nothing is dearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the days of Qurbani or Udhiyya than the sacrificing of animals. And then Nabi ﷺ said that the sacrificed animal shall come on the day of resurrection with its horns, its hair, and its hooves. You need to be weighed as good deeds for that particular person who made the sacrifice. And the sacrifice is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the blood of the animal reaches the ground. Therefore, sacrifice with an open and happy heart. So this is one hadith that's mentioned. There's another hadith where the Prophet sallallahu was asked by the companions that, Ya Rasulullah, what is udhiya? So the Prophet sallallahu said that it is a sunnah of your father Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. And then they asked that what benefit do we get out of it? So the Prophet ﷺ answered, a reward for each and every hair on the sacrificed animal. Just imagine how many little tiny uh, fibers of hair are on these animals. For each and every one, there's a reward for that person. And then they're asked that what about the animals that have wool, Ya Rasulullah? So he said, a reward. He said, for every fiber of the wool, you will get a reward. SubhanAllah. So we can see, um, and that, that hadith, actually the second hadith what I, which I just mentioned is in Ibn Majah and there is a weaker chain over there. However, when it comes to the aspect of relating hadith that have to do with fadl and virtue, the ulama have deemed it as permissible. So these are some of the virtues of sacrificing the animal for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, the next question is, upon whom is qurbani or udhiya necessary? So we have different opinions in this regard. When you talk about the Hanafi scholars, they say that Qurbani or Udhiya is wajib upon every Muslim, whether male or female, who is baligh, who is mature. And on top of that, they own the value of the Nisab on those days of sacrifice. So even if a person attained this wealth the day before and they have it in their possession now, now they must make the Udhiya, whether it's a male or a female that is uh, mature. But if it's a child that is a minor that has the wealth of Nisab, then it's not necessary upon them because they are not mature. And also a person who is a Musafir, who is a traveler on the day, on those particular days of sacrifice, it is not wajib upon them to make the sacrifice as well. But if a person, of course, does it from their wealth anyway, then Alhamdulillah, they will be rewarded for that particular uh, action. Now, when it comes to the Madhab of Imam Shafi, Rahmatullah he mentions that Qurbani or Udhiya itself is a sunnah mu'akkad al-kifaya, meaning even if a few individuals in the community do it, then it will suffice for the community and others will not, yani they're not sinful if they leave it out. However, of course, if a person has the wealth, then of course they should do it because the Prophet ﷺ himself uh, had done it as well. And there are other opinions and other madhahib that mention that if the head of the household uh, does it, any, if, if, they, if they have the uh, sufficient amount of wealth, then it will suffice for everyone else, including the spouse and so on and so forth, who has that uh, particular, um, who owns the amount of nisab. So these are the, pe the people upon who it is necessary to do. Now, what about the days of Qurbani? So the days of Qurbani are from the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. The 9th, of course, is, is what? Is the day of Arafah. The 10th is the day of Eid. So either the 10th, 11th, or 12th, these three days, anyone can sacrifice. However, the earlier one does it, then the better it is. And what time does Qurbani start? So in the towns and the places where the Eid Salah is performed, then Qurbani is only permissible to be done after the Eid Salah is over. 
However, in such places where Eid Salah is not done, very small towns or areas where there's barely anyone, Qurbani can be performed any time after the true dawn or the subh sadiq So basically, after the time of Fajr, it can be done any time in those particular places. Now, what about uh, the shares of the Qurbani animal? That's another question that comes up. So a goat or a sheep may be offered in Udhiya on behalf of one person only. The share will only suffice for one person. However, larger animals such as a cow or a buffalo or a camel, they will suffice for the share of seven people when it comes to Udhiya. Okay, so is it permissible to send our Qurbani or Udhiya or to make it overseas? So the answer is, in principle, yes, it is permissible to do so. However, it is more rewarding to do it, number one, the most preferable way is to do the Qurbani or Udhiya oneself, if one is able to do that. The second most preferable way is if one is present at the place where it is being done and they witness it being done. So these are the best ways that are done. The, then the third best way you can say is to do it in your locality, in your area, where poor people will benefit uh, in your area. But if one does it overseas, then of course it is acceptable as well. Okay, is Qurbani or Udhiya necessary upon the traveler? We had answered this, um, but the traveler, it is not necessary upon them. However, the ulama say that if one does have uh, the means to make this Qurbani or Udhiya, then one should do so because of the great rewards that are involved. So one should not neglect this action just because they are a traveler, but they will attain the rewards if they perform this particular sacrifice. Okay, is it permissible to make qurbani or udhiya on behalf of others? So for example, say you have a family of five and you slaughter a cow. Now there's two shares left over. Can you make the intention uh, for other people when sacrificing? So the answer is yes. The ulama mentioned that qurbani can be made or the udhiya can be made for those people who have passed away, uh, and for their share. So if you make it for a deceased parent or someone else like that, uh, it is permissible to do so. Now, if one is making qurbani on behalf of someone who is living and, you know, whether they have their uh, amount of nisab in their possession or they do not, the ulama mentioned that one should get their, one should attain their permission first and foremost before making a sacrifice on their behalf and then and only then it would be permissible to do so. Okay, so what are the consequences if one does not make Udhiya? Now, there's a narration of the Prophet ﷺ where he has warned those people who have the means to do so, and yet they do not do it. Uh, and he mentions that a person who has the financial means to offer Qurbani or Udhiya and does not do so, then such a person should not be present at our Musalla. Yani they should not even come to the Eid Salah. So it's kind of a warning. Now, again, this is for those people upon it is wajib to do so, and yet they do not they, yet they neglect this particular action. The Prophet ﷺ kind of gives a warning over here, uh, meaning that a person is missing out on the great rewards that one can reap from this particular action. Okay, can a person make Qurbani on the 13th of Dhul Hijjah? If they have missed the 10th, 11th, or 12th for whatever reason, can they do that? Now, according to the majority of jurists, uh, in the Hanafi school, the Hanbali school, as well as the Madiki school, the days of Qurbani are the 10th, 11th, and 12th of Dhul Hijjah. So it is not permissible to slaughter on the 13th of Dhul Hijjah. Now, the Shafi'i scholars do state that if one had missed for whatever reason, if the 13th comes, then it is permissible to make the sacrifice on the 13th. But anything after that, it will not be permissible. Okay, when one is distributing the meat of Qurbani after the slaughter, can it be given to non-Muslims as well? So the answer, uh, according to the Ahnaf, the Hanafi scholars, is that yes, it can be given to non-Muslims as a gift or whatever it may be. But according to the Shafi school, the Shafi school of thought, it is not acceptable to give it to non-Muslims. You should give it to poor Muslims or needy Muslims or any other Muslims uh, that are out there. Is it permissible to sell Qurbani meat? So the answer, the ijma of scholars say that it is not permissible to sell the Qurbani meat. Now, if somebody is doing a service of slaughtering the meat uh, or the animal for a person, then they cannot pay them back in meat as well, in the meat that's slaughtered. They have to pay them separately and the meat itself will be distributed uh, according to the, the scholars. And what they say, the, the best way to go about it, one can give all of it to the poor if they want, 
or what one should do is they can keep some for themselves, give some to their family members and friends, and then distribute uh, to the needy as well. But if one distributes all of it to the needy, that is fine as well. Okay, what should be read when slaughtering? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had mentioned that when a sheep was brought to be sacrificed, he laid it on its side. And then there's a dua that's mentioned in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, Bismillahi Allahumma taqabbal min Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa min ummati Muhammad. Then it said, Thumma dahhabi. So the Prophet ﷺ made a dua. He said, In the name of Allah, O oh Allah, accept it from Muhammad, accept it from the house of Muhammad, yani the people in his family, as well as the nation of Muhammad. So the Prophet ﷺ made a sacrifice actually for the intention, not only of himself and his family, but for the ummah in general, subhanAllah. Then he sacrificed it. So that's mentioned over there. But the, the bare minimum that one should say when they slaughter is Bismillah and Allahu Akbar, and then they should sacrifice. And remember, when sacrificing, it should be done with ihsan in the best of ways. As the Prophet ﷺ said, even the sacrifice is done with ihsan and with excellence. So one should not do things like sharpen the knife in front of the animal uh, before it is being slaughtered, yet when it's, when it's being laid down. Or one should not slaughter in front of other animals as to cause psychological trauma to other animals, right? These are things that should be done. The knife should be sharpened uh, before the animal sees it in the best of ways, and then it should be done in a quick way so as, as to make it the most painless way for the animal. Okay, now another question uh, that comes up. So some people ask that w that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, we know that uh, when it comes to the aspect of Qurbani and Udhiyah, one of the things that's being commemorated is how Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was given the command to slaughter his son Ismail alayhi salatu was salam. But of course, when submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he replaced Ismail alayhi salatu was salam with the sheep from the heavens and thus the sheep was sacrificed. So to commemorate this great noble sacrifice and submission of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, we make Qurbani every year. But when was the first Qurbani undertaken? So the actual first sacrifice of an animal in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was undertaken by the son of Adam alayhi salatu was salam, Habil. Right? The Quran describes this in, um, in, in, uh, as well, how both the sons of, of, of Adam alayhi salatu was salam were commanded to uh, present a sacrifice and Habil sacrificed a lamb which was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while the sacrifice of Qabil was not accepted. So sacrificing an animal in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing new and it's not even from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was but it's from the time of Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Okay, so when consuming the meat or when slaughtering the meat for the animal, what are the parts of the animal which are impermissible or haram to consume? So according to the Hanafi scholars uh, and some other scholars as well, the consumption of seven parts are haram and impermissible to consume. Even if the animal is slaughtered in a permissible way, for example, the genitals of the male and the female, one and two. Thirdly, the bladder of the animal. Fourthly, the glands. Fifthly, the testicles. Sixthly, the gallbladder. And then the flowing blood. So these seven parts are not permissible to be consumed by the person when it comes to uh, the slaughter of the animal. Okay, can one slaughter any other animals? Uh, what other animals can one slaughter for Qurbani? So the only animals that are permissible to slaughter are camels, cows, ox, buffalo, goats, and sheep. These are the only types of animals that one can slaughter for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, animals like chickens or turkeys or rabbits or you know anything like that it is not permissible for the sake of qurbani only these particular animals that were listed are permissible to do so and again the larger animals are seven shares while the smaller ones are uh one share for a person okay can one freeze the qurbani meat from one year to the next or does it have to be distributed immediately or eaten immediately so the prophet ﷺ, um you know he did not forbid the aspect of of storing the meat, one can store the meat and one can freeze it, it is permissible to do that. Okay, when performing Hajj, must one slaughter the Qurbani animal as well? So the Hujjaj, when they are in Hajj, they slaughter the Hadi, 
or the animal uh, after the on, on the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, yani after going back to Mina from Arafah. So this is the slaughter for them. Now, the Hanafi school does say that if one is not a resident and if they have the means, they should make a separate sacrifice for the Qurbani as well. But most of the Hajjaj are considered as travelers and Musafirin. So in that case, it is not necessary for them to do that, but just the one animal that they slaughter at the time of Hajj. Okay, what's the what's the ruling for the Madikis and the Hanbalis on, on the aspect of Udhiyah? So they mention it is a Sunnah, Sunnah Mu'akkadah. So if in an individual, again, as we said before, that if an individual or head of household, for example, slaughters a goat or sheep for the entire family, then it suffices for the entire family. But according to the Hanafi school, it's only valid for one person. Okay, is it obligatory to distribute the qurbani meat to the poor people on behalf of the deceased? So if you are making udhiyah with your own money on behalf of someone who has passed away, it will be permissible to distribute the meat in any way that one wishes. However, if the deceased had made a bequest or a wasiyah that... Uh, to make qurbani on their behalf after they have passed away and the money is taken from their estate in the wasiyah, then it's necessary to distribute all of the meat to the poor and one cannot keep it for themselves or give it to their friends or family members or anything like that. And then another question that comes up usually is the aspect of cutting the hair and the nails in the time in these particular days. So there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that says that if the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah began and one of you intends to sacrifice, then let him not remove anything from his hair or his skin. So now this means if it, one intends to sacrifice, it means whether they intend to do so themselves or to watch it or to do it somewhere else. So basically, according to the, the, the Hanafi school, they mentioned that this is a mustahab action. It's a recommended action. So if one does these things anyway, then it's not going to affect uh, you know, it's not going to be a sin upon them or it's not going to be anything which is um, you know I guess you could say sinful or something in that particular sense but rather it's a recommendation so if one does it then they will be rewarded if one does not do it then there's no harm no foul you can say now the reason why this this is mentioned is, is uh, many of the scholars say it's kind of to emulate the hujjah during this particular time as well so after the sacrifice is done then cut these uh, cut the hair or cut the nails after that now, there is a particular ruling which is stronger than this in from a hadith. For example, if somebody has hairs in the pubic region that they had not shaved or cut for more than 40 days, then it becomes actually incumbent upon them to cut these hairs, even if they are in these particular days, uh, because of the stronger hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that one is actually sinful if they uh, do not cut these hairs after that particular period of time. So these are some of the narrations that, or the, some of the questions that come up. Now, there are other questions as well, like, for example, the age of the animals and what are the conditions of the animals that can be slaughtered and so on and so forth. And, you know, alhamdulillah, when it, when it comes to this particular aspect, those who are uh, performing these slaughters, they are aware of these uh, types of rules and regulations. So, um, so alhamdulillah, it makes it easier in that particular sense. Um, you know, for example, when it says animals that are not permissible to, to slaughter, it's mentioned that an animal born without ears, or if one third or more of the tail or ear is cut off, or an animal with no teeth or most of the teeth have been broken off, or an animal that is blind in one or both eyes, or a lame animal, a crippled animal that cannot walk to the place of the slaughter, or an animal whose horn or horns is broken off from the root, or an animal that is so severely sick that it cannot walk to the place of the slaughter. So these are some of the, the animals that cannot be sacrificed or some of the conditions in that particular sense. Right now, similarly, when it comes to the age of the animals, there's also the aspect of the, of the age. So it's mentioned that a goat, for example, must be at least one years old. Uh, a sheep that, uh, if a sheep that is uh, six months old is such that due to being any very healthy in sense or big in size, it is not distinguishable from uh, other one year old animals, then it would be permissible to slaughter it for qurbani. So even if it's six months old, a sheep, and if it's large like a one year old, then in that case it would be permissible and suitable for that. For cows and buffaloes, the minimum age is two years, while a camel has to be at least five years old. So these are the what the fuqaha mentioned in their books, and these are the ages of the particular animals. So that being said, these are some of the 
frequently asked questions you can see when it comes to Qurbani or Udhiya. If anyone has any other questions, you can email me mufti at islamstl.org and inshallah we will answer that question. Wa jazakum Allahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.